All right, what's happening, people? Welcome to the Course Creator Community Podcast. I'm super excited because we've got an awesome guest on the line this week, all the way from Seattle. She's an expert uh, when it comes to creating online scalable music education programs. So if you're a music educator, you're a musician, you're a music teacher, you want to get online, there's no better person in the world to speak to than this woman here. So without further ado, let me introduce the one and only Ms. Jamie Slutsky. Jamie, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for that warm introduction. No, thank you for for being awesome. And I'll I'll give your podcast a bit of a plug now as well. If you're listening to this and you are in that music space, go over and check out Jamie's podcast. I'll put the link down in the show notes because she'll give tips like this every single week. So I recommend checking that out. Um, But Jamie, I like to start all my podcasts off with a quote or mantra that inspires you or fires you up. Have you oh, got absolutely. Voice? Yes. Yes. Um, a rising tide lifts all boats. I mean, okay. I'm all about collaboration, all about um, what's good for one is good for many. Yes. Love that. So I'm a huge fan collaboration myself. The way I see it, your competition probably isn't going anywhere. If they're good at what they do. They're probably not going anywhere. Right. So you can't really try and hide them from your, your followers and that they're there. You're there. Hey, how can you make it a a win-win? So I love that. Now, Jamie, I've been following you for a while. Someone made a post in the Facebook group. They were like, hey, you know, I'm a music person. How can I get my courses online? And a few people tagged you. And I was like, all right, let me check out this woman. (laughs) I'm like, okay, she knows a thing or two. She's pretty good. So I know that you're good at what you do. I've been following you a while. I know what it is you do. But for anyone listening that maybe isn't familiar, do you want to let us know in the next sort of five, 10 minutes, what is it that you actually do? And how did you get into that? Absolutely, for sure. So I work with music teachers who are ready to expand beyond one-on-one lessons in the online space. So I work with my clients on creating self-paced courses, um, creating group programs, creating um, hybrid programs, membership sites, you name it, as long as there's an online component to it and it's one-to-many teaching, that's where I spend my time. I work with my clients on the tech side of things, which is where I started from, but I'm going to talk a little bit first about what I really, really love, which is most of my clients come to me with a vision for what they are creating. They have like that 30,000 foot view. I love taking that down to street level Mm. so that we can actually build this thing so that when you look at it from 30,000 feet, you actually see that it's a city. Mm. I love the strategy side, the why are we building this? How are we doing it? I came to all of this, as I said, from the tech side. I got my degree in computer science back in 1999. Yes, I am dating myself and I'm very proud of that. You finished it it when you were five? Is that how it works? (laughs) No, no. And I'm very happy about this. (laughs) I've got lots of life experience. (laughs) Um, But I come from a very technical space. I understand how computers work. I understand how methodologies are built and things like that. And I then spent a decade working in corporate IT um, for one of the best retail organizations on the planet, Costco Wholesale. Um, I still shop there regularly. (laughs) And what I learned from them was user experience, user feeling. How does someone feel when they walk into the warehouse? It's the same thing that I've translated into the online space. How does someone feel when they get on your website? How do they feel when they receive your emails? How do they feel when they are saying yes to your course? And then when they come inside your course, how do they feel? How do they know that you're taking care of them? So I learned all of that. And so I kind of mesh these two things into my I'm ready to be at home and be mom. Mm. And so I just kind of took all of this and started freelance website development. And then it just one thing led to the next, led to the next. And I found myself in the space where I was working with a lot of course creators. And my favorite course creator of all time that I've ever worked with teaches people how to play the bass guitar. And I just loved it. And from her, I realized that 
I could work with music teachers exclusively Mm. and what music teachers bring to the plate and bring to the online space is a place for people to have a creative outlet. Mm. When someone comes and takes a music education program, they're not coming to take it to check a box. They're not coming to take it to fill a need or to fix something. They're coming to it for per, pure for pure enjoyment and for their own soul and for their own creativity. And I just love being in this space. So that is my long story short. Love it. Quick question. Are you a musician yourself or do you play music? No, not okay. at all. The last That's time awesome. I played an instrument was in eighth grade band. Yeah. And I'm fine with that. And all of my clients know it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's an advantage, right? Because you can look at it from not the musician side of things, which I think is cool. Someone might be so stuck in their space where it's like, oh, it's got to be this thing here. But if you come at it from a non-musician, it's going to, there's an advantage to that as well. So I, I love that. And I love, um, I love how you've also narrowed down. I think that's a good message for everyone listening as well. It's sort of like, hey, I don't just help course creators. You know, I help music people get their mm-hmm. online course together. They, that way the course can be more specific to that. The marketing can be more specific to that. It's easier to target these people if we know they're just music people. So I think that's a good business lesson for everyone uh, listening there as well. So love that. Uh, let's get into the tips, Jamie. So let's say someone's listening. To, oh, sorry. The other thing, the reason why I think that's such a, a good market And if you are a music person, it's such a good reason to get online. It's such a proven concept. Like Mm -hmm. people have been taking, you know, learn to sing and learn piano. Like these courses have been around for years. Like the concept is proven. You know, you see some, some funny um, courses out there. And, you know, I was speaking to someone the other day, you know, their, their course is about how to turn 40, you know, the best way to turn 40. And (laughs) I I don't know, maybe it sells well, maybe it doesn't. I don't know. Right. But Mm -hmm. it's sort of, it's sort of a gamble. You know, it's not really a proven concept. You know, there's some other ones, other ones out there. I'm sure we've all seen some funny courses like learning a musical instrument. Now, maybe languages, I guess, is another and maybe dancing as well. Maybe those three have sort of, you know, been around for ages, but it's a proven concept. So I think if if you've got that skill, there's been people for years that have been paying for courses and tutors and and whatever. So love that. Um, All right, let's get into some practical tips, Jamie. So let's say someone's listening to this. They're a music person. They've got an idea, um, but they don't know where to start. Or maybe they tried something and it just flopped. (laughs) What what can you maybe start from? I'm going to hand it over to you. Start where you want to start. What's the first thing someone needs? This A music person. What's the word? Music person, music educator, music. Music teacher, music educator. I use those two terms pretty interchangeably. Yeah. Music teacher. What's the, they want to get online. What's the first thing they got to do? Oh my goodness. What's the first thing? Well, there's like, that's. That's a good question because the first thing that they have to realize is actually I have three things that they need to figure out. And I actually just wrote this recently. And so now let's see if I can remember myself. (laughs) The first one is understanding what they want someone to get out of the program that they are creating. So think about what it is that you teach best and how you can, you know, and what that actually is. The next thing that they need to figure out is where are people at when they are ready to take this program? Mm. Are they a beginner? Are they somebody who is trying to get into a college music program? Are they trying to get a scholarship? Are they trying to get the lead, you know, a solo in their high school band? Are they, what are they doing? Where are they actually at in their lives right now that gets them searching because those are those two things we know we need to know where we're taking them but we also need to know where we're taking them from yeah. are they're so so important and then the third thing is something that has just like completely slipped my mind at the moment but let's see the third thing that we want to make sure Do you want me to summarize those first two while you get the third one no that's okay <laughs> the, It's really, you know, we want to make sure we know where we're taking them. We want to know where they are coming from. And we want to know how we want to teach them. Mm -hmm. We want to know, are we going to be teaching them live on camera 
in a group setting? Are we going to be teaching them through pre-recorded video content? Are we going to be teaching them through pre-recorded video content with a live component? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Do we have a Slack channel? Do we have a Facebook group? Do we have, what, what, what is it that we're using as our main tools? So while Yes, we absolutely, you know, when someone comes online to say, I want to create a music program, there are a lot of variables. Mm -hmm. If we can answer those three things, then we can create a sales page. Mm -hmm. And if we can create a sales page, then we can create an outline. And if we can create an outline, we can create a syllabus. And as it keeps going on and on and on, and all of a sudden we now have a program. If we don't answer those questions, then we can continue to spin our wheels. We are never knowing who we're marketing to if we don't know where they're at. We never know what we're selling if we don't know what that end product is. And people can't make the decision for actually saying yes to learning this way if they don't know how they're going to be offered the material. Love it. Yes, I think they're, they're great because I think a lot of people when they start off, the the goal is this grandiose program, you know, mm-hmm. hey, I'm going to be the best. I'm going to be a whole music education place. There's going to be piano, guitars, drums. <laughs> it's going to be beginners, advanced, intermediate, super advanced. And like, sounds good in theory, but that's going to take you a lifetime to put together. And and I think it's a, it's a good long-term goal. But starting off, like that's going to be so hard to market to because there's there's Mm -hmm. the old saying, if you try and speak to everyone, you end up speaking to no one. And I think if you haven't answered those questions that Jamie mentioned there, you're going to be speaking to no one. It's it's too hard, you know, but if you can narrow that down and and whatever of those is, they, they all can work. Hey, you're a beginner. You got absolutely no idea. You suck at music. You're a slow learner. Hey, let me teach you the absolute basics to get you to okay. You know, Mm -hmm. hey, Mm -hmm. you've tried a bit, but you've hit a peak. You know, let me take you to that next bit. Like they've all got their their place, but it's easier if you just speak to that one person for for marketing purposes. So I, I love that. And I love how you broke it down where you're like, all right, if you answer those three, then you can create a sales page. Now, I love that. And I'm, I'm going to um, ask you to expand <laughs> a little bit on there because I think the common, common thing is right. Let me put my course together and then let me go and try and answer all these things here. And I think that's doing it the hard way. So do you want to explain to me, Jamie? Some people might be listening. They're like, hold on. So I, I do that. Then I create the sales page. How can I have a sales page if I haven't got my course? Can you tell <laughs> us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not saying that you have to start selling. I'm just saying that if you're really, really clear on what it is that you're selling, then you can build it out. You can say, you can share what if scenarios, you can share experiences from past students, because that's one of the things that I love so much about course creation and online programs in general, is that people who create them generally have a track record mm-hmm. with one-on-one teaching first. So you uh, have Otherwise stories. you shouldn't be creating that course, right? <laughs> I'll, <laughs> exactly. I'll, jump, I'll jump in there for a sec. I was speaking to a guy the other day and he's like, Johnny, can you help me put my course together? I'm like, yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, what's, what's the course on? And it was, oh, what was, um, yeah, no, he's like, yeah, I've got this course. Um, but I just, I, I don't know how to get students for it. You know, I just, I'm struggling with the, the marketing side of things. And I was like, okay, what's your course on? He's like, oh, it's how to do organic marketing. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like so can't you just teach what you're doing in the course? He's like, oh, but I actually haven't got any experience in organic marketing. And I'm like, so you created a course on organic marketing when you have no experience in it? I'm like, sorry, man, I probably can't help you. Um, But whereas if it's a, if it's like a music teacher, it's like, Hey, you've, and if not, if not, yeah, no, sorry, continue on. But I guess even if it's not, um, no, yeah, with a music teacher, it is going to, you're going to have some sort of results. Otherwise you're not a music teacher. Yeah. you, You, you aren't going to come straight out of college and create an online course. You will have taught people while you're in college, even if, like you never thought of it. You that's part of the culture in music in the music education space is that we start teaching. I mean, I, I've had some clients who started teaching at fourteen. Mm. That you know, so it's one of those things that you have experience. So what again, when we go to the, build this sales page, we can share stories. 
of clients who've had success, even if they have never taken this course. Mm. They, you know, and that, you know, and the nice thing is, is as you're going through it in your mind of, oh yeah, I had this client, Jamie, she hadn't played an instrument since eighth grade, but Mm. she decided she really wanted to play the piano. And so she took, you know, a lesson with me and I got her over this hill sparks an idea. I need to make sure inside my course that I get somebody over the fear of touching the piano keys. Mm -hmm. Boom. As you build out your sales page content, even if that's not your final content, that's why I say that goes into helping you to create your syllabus, which creates your curriculum, which then is what you use to actually deliver your program. Yes. Awesome. Love that. Okay. Now I think we can go two ways from here. We can either talk about how do we get people in there or we can talk about how to actually create the course. Maybe let's go with creating the course side of things. So I've never created a music course myself. I've never actually even participated in one. And all the courses I create are pretty easy because I can just put it on video. As long as you can see me in the audio, doesn't completely suck. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm guessing with music, Your audio has got to be on point. The cameras might have to be a little bit more on point. What, what can you sort of tell us there? Yeah, that's actually a really great question because if we're doing a pre-recorded course, which is, I think a lot of what people who are listening right now are doing is pre-recorded courses. I think that the best thing to do is to make sure that you know what you need to show on the screen at every point in time. Mm. Sometimes you'll be able to do a talking head, talking straight to camera. Sometimes you need to show the instrument and the hands and the feet yeah. and whatever else it is, but you don't need to show your own face. Yeah. And other times you need to show both. And so you want to be able to use um, multiple cameras. I know I've got a client who uses OBS as her software for it. And she uses her phone as one of her cameras and her webcam as the other camera. She has gotcha. them integrated and she's got the phone on a boom stand so that it's, it's over the, uh, the piano keyboard. So you can see mm. the, you know, her fingers on the, on the keys and she uses that. And so people can see her face because she teaches young kids. She needs them to see the animation in her face. Mm. And so you kind of have to play with that. I have another friend who teaches the guitar and she just has a setup where she's got really good cameras. And so she does, I think she has three cameras that record when she does it. And she does all the blending in post-production. So she actually takes the time after she's done the recording to take, okay, the, the camera that was pointing at her face is zoomed in on her face. The camera that is pointing at where she's strumming is, you know, zoomed in on that. And the camera that's on, you know, on the, the frets, I think it is (laughs) again, I'm not a music teacher myself. (laughs) And, you know, she, she has her cameras doing different things and she spends a lot of time in post editing, Mm -hmm bringing those three pieces together. And the nice thing with what she's doing actually with, with both, both of these clients is that they only take audio from one microphone yeah. or, uh, you know, in the, in this case, both of them take audio from one microphone. I know someone else who puts a mic, you know, has a microphone right next to their musical instrument and then they wear a lapel mic oh, yeah, okay. and then they can, they can use one or the other, depending on what part of their video that they're putting together. So it really depends on where you're going and what Mm. you're teaching and who your audience is. Because again, if you are teaching kids, they need to see your human animation. They need Mm. to see you. If you're teaching someone who is at a much higher level, who wants to learn something technical, they may never need to see your face. They may only need to hear your, your voice, see you doing the work and be able to emulate it and learn from that. So it really depends on who you're teaching as to how your video needs to look. Um, I think it's really important to keep that in mind as you're putting it together, because otherwise your sound's going to be off or people are not going to be able to pay attention to the right thing. They might see the cat walking behind you or things like that. So. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So a couple follow-up questions with that. Let's say someone completely sucks at tech, right? <laughs> Obviously they should hire you and do one of your programs and that'll, that'll solve that problem, but maybe they want to 
um, just get started, can they get started with one camera decent mic? Or is it like, hey, if you're going to do that, it's not really worth it. You know, you need at least two. What are, you, <laughs> what are your thoughts there? My thought is that you can get by with just one, but you're going to be a whole lot better off if you use your phone as a second camera. Yeah. I'm not saying you have to go out and buy a multiple hundred dollar um, yeah. webcam and do all these fancy things or an SLR and, you know, and do all these other things in a tripod and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I do think that having a second angle is really yeah. beneficial, yeah. but it, I wouldn't, tur- I wouldn't say don't ever do just one, you know, don't yeah, yeah, ever, yeah, yeah. like, I think you'll be fine yeah. as long as you're very aware that you may have to splice some videos together and you can use pretty simple tools to splice those videos together. You don't have to do fancy animations, you know, and, you know, moving things around and sliding things on the screen and stuff. You can use just clip, clip, say, okay, well, here is me talking to the camera and Mm -hmm. explaining what I'm going to do. And then you change your camera angle to point to the keyboard or to point to the instrument, and then you play it and then you come back and you, you repeat. And so, the generally the way that we teach is tell them what we're going to teach them, teach them, explain what we just taught them. And so if you think of that methodology, then you just take that one camera and you talk, do talking head to the instrument and back to talking head. Gotcha. Yeah. Love that. And even just some, some tips that I've found as well, like just as Jamie mentioned, most your computer probably has some sort of webcam on there, which is good enough. You've mm-hmm. probably got a phone anyway, which is better than good enough. You know, so mm-hmm. you've got two there. You can get a tripod for like 20 bucks on Amazon, you know, like a decent yep. tripod. I think that I think that's worth the investment. You probably can get two of them, you know, and you can set them around to, to save you fiddling in that. And like, if you want the third, you probably, or you may live with someone who's got a, a, a phone as well. So if you need three, okay, hey, can I borrow mm-hmm. your phone for a bit, you know, or maybe you've got an old phone, you know, like there's, there's options there as well. So totally. like, or maybe you've got an iPad, you know, and you've got an iPhone as well. So I'm an Apple person, as you can't tell, if you can't <laughs> tell, which is why I'm using all the eyes, which is cool. Yep. Uh, and then follow up from there, Jamie. So because there might be people listening to this that are like, that's just so much tech. I'm never, ever, <laughs> I'm never, ever going to be able to set up these cameras and then get a microphone. I don't know what a microphone to get. Then what video editing software do I get? And then, you know, how do I edit it? Like, if you could give me, give us, give the listeners some guidance there. Is it just one of those things that, hey, you got to learn it, whether it's with yourself or you do a course or you hire someone like you need to have a basic understanding yourself to, to do this course or can you just outsource it all and be like, Hey, here are all the videos go and do whatever. What, what's your take there? My feeling is that you come across better on camera when you know what you're doing. Yeah. And what I mean by that is if you are apprehensive about the tech, you're going to come through a little bit choppy and don't not come across as the expert of the musical instrument that you're teaching mm-hmm. because you're worried about the tech. So if you don't want to worry about the tech, get on some calls with people and have all of your tech stuff lined up, figured out before you start recording. Mm -hmm. If you want to DIY it, watch some YouTube videos, take a course, do what you need to do so that you can show up on camera the best that you can. That is probably my best opinion on this and, you know, kind of where I would go with it mm-hmm. is that it's less about actually doing the tech, but more about having the right level of confidence and being fully sure that what you're creating is worth creating. And if you have a tech fear, let's get that, get past that before we start creating a lot of content. Yeah. And, the, and you teach this sort of stuff, Jamie? Um, I, I do a lot of that in my coaching work, you know, so I, I coach my clients as well as do consulting, as well as do implementation because, well, that's, that's how you keep things fun. Right. Um, and so I don't necessarily say, okay, we're going to use this piece of software. We're going to use these angles and stuff necessarily. But if I've got a client who's like, okay, I'm ready to record. Can we check our angles? Mm. Absolutely. We will set that up. We'll make it all work. Um, You know, again, like my client who uses OBS, she learned it all on YouTube. Yeah. All of it. Yeah. And even, even there's places like Udemy, which has Mm -hmm. got some, you know, 
affordable basic courses that can that can teach you this sort of stuff. I think I, the reason I said I bought a course on OBS on um, Udemy. I didn't finish it, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I it, it, I I because I didn't need it really, you know. But it was uh-huh. like I saw like I I, I and I learned. I saw someone else do it. They were doing these really good live streams on Facebook. And mm-hmm. I'm like, this is sick. My live stream is just me holding my phone like this. You know, what are they doing? Yep. And I did mm-hmm. some research on, on their, or they said it somewhere, hey, we're using OBS to do this. I was like, what's this OBS thing? Let me go and do a course, you know, did a course, learned some stuff. But then it was yep. just like, man, this is stuff that's, for what I do, it's too complicated. I don't need to do that, you know? So I gave up halfway through, but I'm sure there's people out there that, you know, if you do, if, you, if I was more motivated, I was like, hey, I got to learn this stuff. You know, I would have learned it there, you know? So I think it's, yeah. you know, it's, just, it's just one of those things like, it's a skill. You know, if you want to put together an online course, there's certain skills that you need to learn. You don't need to be the next videographer, um, but you need to know these basic things here. And I think once you have a basic knowledge, everything gets a lot easier. I think it's, and I think then it's easier to outsource as well because you could I think simply, so. yeah. you could, well, I think you could say you put the first one together to yourself, say you then hire a virtual assistant, you know, Hey, here's how I do it. Step by step by step, just do the same thing, you know, or right, if, you, right. if you outsource to a, a video, Hey, here's what I've got here. How could I make it better? You know, right. or if you're, you're speaking to someone else who does a, a music course, man, here's what I do. What do you do? Oh, you do that. How'd you do that? Oh, you've just got a camera back there. Let me go and do that. You know, mm-hmm. like, and, and the best example I can give is with a microphone. Cause I also do, I also run a fitness business and the microphone I'm using now is great for podcasts, but I can't use, I can't use this for fitness. You know, as soon as no, I jump around, not. you're not going to, not going to hear anything. And I was like, what can I do? You know, I had a lapel mic, but even then I couldn't really, I can't use a lapel mic either because if I jump around it, it comes out. You know, right. So I used to have a lapel mic and demonstrate someone else. I get someone else to demonstrate the exercises. And then I was speaking to another guy and I'm like, what, you, what microphone are you using? Your audio is so good. And it's like, well, I'm simply using this microphone here. I'm like, send me the Amazon link, you know, went and bought it. But the only reason I was able to go through all those steps was like, okay, you know, I know that audio is important. I know that if I don't use this mic, it's not that good. I know that if I'm jumping around, this mic isn't going to be good. I know I need a wireless one. Mm -hmm, Where are mm -hmm. these wireless ones? Oh, that does, oh, this one's good here. You know, so that's important there. Um, What what about the the marketing, Jamie? What if someone's like, all right, Jamie, you know, I'm good with all that. I've got a course, you know, I've got a, a market. I've put a few people through it, but they were just, you know, ex-students or friends of friends or, right. or whatever. I've got 50 ex-students on my list and I've already emailed them and two people bought. Like, how do I get new people in this in this list? What yeah. tips can you give us there? Yeah, you know, my this is my this is my favorite go-to tip that I share with all of my clients is that we want to slide into social media where our audience is. And my favorite example is if you are a piano teacher and your course is for people who play soccer and want to play the piano, okay? Like really super specific, right? What do soccer moms talk about on Instagram? What hashtags are they using? Who are they following? Where are they with their conversation? How can we get ourselves into that conversation and have that relationship and grow that relationship? It's got nothing to do with piano. Mm -hmm. It has everything to do with raising a wholesome child. It has everything to do with raising an academic child or a sports athlete or whatever it is. We want to be part of the conversation and not push our way in. You kind of think about it like when you're in, at a networking event or at a holiday party or, you know, you're out there, you don't walk up to somebody and say, hey, I've got this course. You say, hey, what are you drinking? Right? What, what, what are you drinking? Or you say, oh, you know, I see your, your kids over there playing with my kid. You know, how old is your, your kid? You know, you have those conversations and we have to take that same concept from real world and pull it back and bring it back into, into the online space, into um, our online marketing. And this is a lot of the, the organic marketing, which is where I help my clients, you know, find, find their space is I think that we're not trying to sell our course to thousands of people. 
that's not who my market is. My market mm -hmm. wants to have 10 to 15 people going through their different programs at different points in time, maybe up to 50 people. I've got, you know, that client that I was telling you about at the beginning on, she's got a, a couple hundred people going through her course at every one time. So, you know, I mean, we're not marketing to the masses. We have the time to have conversations and to get into organic conversations and get into a place where someone looks at us and say, oh, and you have a piano course? How cool is that? Let me go check it out. Gotcha. So let me get my head around that. The goal is essentially to, to have an audience, not necessarily a, hey, he's a how to learn piano audience. Your audience is whatever it is. It's moms, it's Christians, it's Greek Australians, you know, it's, it's whatever, it, <laughs> whatever it is, you're involved in that community of people there. And it just so happens that this is the service that you offer that community. Is that right. what you're saying there? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying that most often when we're doing the organic marketing with a music program is because you know, like people buy a music program because they want to add something to their lives. Mm. They want to improve on something. And so because this is not their life, this is not their everything, this is not for their career, this is not for you know a, a lot of other things, when they can see us in a, a, you know and having a relationship with us within the context of their life that already exists, it's a lot easier for them to say, oh, yeah, I, I might consider that. And we have to be willing, and this is the other big thing, we have to be willing to share what we sell. Mm. It's so often that people put the link to their course in their bio on Instagram, and they never talk about it. Mm. The link that's in my bio on Instagram is to book a call with me. Mm. That is what it is. And I talk about that in everything I do. I'm like, if you want to send me a DM, book, click the link in my bio, you know, we have to invite people into conversation um, as well. Gotcha. Okay, cool. So that's given us some good uh, guidance on the, the marketing there. The selling side of things now, Jamie. So two questions here. What sort of, I'm guessing the answer is going to be, it depends, but if you can give us some guidelines, what sort of pricing do most of your students use or what's an, an average pricing for a music course? What's the most expensive you've seen? So we'll talk about pricing, but mm -hmm. then also how do we sell it? Is it via a phone call like you do with your services or do we do it via a, a landing page? Is it a, a free webinar or a free lesson? Is it a YouTube tutorial? What, what can you tell us about the, the selling side of things? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> you knew that was coming, I knew but it. no, it really does. Um, I would say that in order to make sure that you, that pe people understand the value of your program, making sure that we don't price ourselves on Udemy scale. That is something I'm really, really adamant about you are worth more than the slashed pricing on programs like that, on software like that. So I just have to put that out there. I don't want to see music programs under $150 US. I just don't. Mm. Even I don't care how long they are or how short they are. Yep. I would say that $150 US is the bare minimum that I'm willing to put on a price tag gotcha. for my clients. I push them. I push them pretty hard to make sure that we're above that. Um, I just came up with a pricing for a client um, earlier today, you know, the, on the day that we're recording this. And we determined that $300 was the price point or three payments of $125. Gotcha. So it's either 300 or 375, depending on if they wanted the payment options. Um, and, and she felt good with it. I felt good with it, knowing what we were putting together. It was, you know, the number of calls, the number of lessons and all of those things, you look at it and you make sure that, you know, that the value is associated, easily associated with that price. If she was at a different point and was teaching a different program, this same program, same length of time could be 800 or a thousand dollars. It really mm -hmm. depends again, going back to what I said at the beginning, who is your audience? What are they trying to get? Where are they at in the process? And how are you presenting this program? Question, so question there, yeah. what's the most expensive you've seen for one, one course, music course? I am trying to remember, um, 
the most expensive I think was about 1400. Okay. And that was uh, the course plus some one-on-one coaching with okay. it. Yep. I think that was the most expensive that I've seen. Um, but I, I, I can't remember offhand. Most of my clients do shorter length programs, anywhere from six to 12 weeks. Gotcha. So because of, because of that, or, you know, I mean, six to 12 modules, even if it's an asynchronous, completely asynchronous program. So, you know, we have to associate the price and, you know, and where, again, where the student is at, you know, if someone's just taking this because they want to be able to sit around the piano and, you know, and play with their family, mm-hmm. that's a far different reason. And they're not going to spend nearly as much as someone who's trying to get a scholarship to a college program. So gotcha. that's awesome. that. And then that directly ties in to how are we selling this? Mm. Because if you're selling a $300 program, you may sell it with a call and a sales page. You may sell it with a DM and a sales page. You know, I mean, it may, it, those are kind of the big ways, generally speaking, that we, that we do it is with a sales page and either a call to, you know, to, to figure out fit, or it may be just um, DMs on Instagram or on Facebook, or, you know, even a, a WhatsApp or text message. Gotcha. Okay. Makes sense. Um, Jamie, so there's a couple of questions I always like to finish up with on this podcast. The first one is around course platforms. Now I'm curious to hear what platform you use with your courses uh, or if there's a particular platform that you recommend. Okay. Well, I am going to plug Thinkific from here to you know where, because it is my favorite platform. Um, I am a Thinkific expert. I have been an expert on the Thinkific platform since they started the program in January of 2016. So that is my platform of choice. My second platform that I use pretty extensively with clients is WordPress with LearnDash on top of it. So Mm -hmm. those are the two that I use most often. Um, I am friends with the founders of Member Vault. I've been to their house. I've met their two older kids. I haven't met their third because the third is still a baby and we're in a pandemic. Um, so I love their platform as well. I just don't work with it nearly as much, um, but I have two clients on it right now. So okay. yeah. No, Thinkific is always a popular um, answer to that question there. Final question, Jamie, you're obviously a mentor for plenty of music teachers out there that want to get their courses online. I'm curious to hear who your biggest mentors have been. And if you could answer this in a few different ways, if you could give us a uh, paid mentor, so someone that you've paid money to, you've done their course or their coaching program or whatever, mm-hmm. an unpaid mentor, so you haven't paid them any cash, but you follow them on social, whether it's YouTube, Instagram, whatever it may be, mm-hmm. and a book that you recommend every course creator should read if they want to sell more of their online courses. You're going to get mad at me for this one, <laughs> but I don't have an answer to okay. any one part of that. And the reason why is because I have learned from so many people Mm -hmm. along the way. I have listened to hundreds of hours of podcast content. I have watched and been involved in masterminds and in programs that are paid and free. I have built myself a network over the past five to seven years of business mentors. And I couldn't pull out a single name for that. Um, So I know that that really is not the answer you want, but that's where I'm at at this point. Um, I I just did a lot of, of free learning and a lot of just learning from multiple people because I knew there wasn't just one right answer out there. Um, With respect to a book, I struggled with that as well. I knew this question was coming because of course I've listened to the podcast. And I think that even though it wasn't something that really helped me on my journey, I really enjoyed reading Pat Flynn's Will It Fly? I really enjoyed reading that book just because it was a, it was a litmus test and I'm all about testing, making sure that there's some validity before we get started. So I think that that's a good resource. Yes. Huge fan of that book myself. Um, awesome. All right, Jamie, that's pretty much all I wanted to get through today. Is there anything I should have asked you, but forgot to, or anything you want to finish us off with? 
Um, the biggest thing that I think that is really important is if you think that you want to create a music program, really, truly understand what people look to you for, as well as what you want to put out there, because mm -hmm. those could be two very different things. You could be somebody that people look to for support, but not necessarily for a high level of pedagogy. You want to make sure that what you're putting out there matches what people already see in you. And if you want to put out something different, start grooming your audience now for the transition. Start really talking about and switching things over so that people can see you through the lens that you want them to see you through, um, because otherwise they're never going to buy your program. Yes, agree. Awesome. All right, Jamie, well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.